Thanks, Johanna. Um, and let me start the screen sharing. Um, and I think you can now see my screens in full screen and you can also see the cursor. Yes, okay. everything's fine. And yes, I'd, I'd be happy to take uh, questions at any point in between. So just, yeah, as Johanna said, type them in the chat or just feel free to, to interrupt me with any questions. And I'll do my best to, to stop um, so that there's um, sufficient time in the end for more questions and discussion. So um, yesterday I, I talked about quantum gravity in the asymptotic safety paradigm. And today I, I'll go back to yesterday's introduction where I raised the question, what are the fundamental building blocks of nature? And of course, those fundamental building blocks are sort of the building blocks or the microstructure of quantum space-time, but they're also the building blocks of matter. Um, and so today I'll talk about both and, and the interplay between them. Um, and the motivation um, for that really is this very simple observation that already classically, <clears throat> you can't very well separate matter from space-time because matter impacts the structure of space-time and also vice versa, um, the, the structure of space-time impacts the, the dynamics and the behavior of matter. Um, and so if you really want to understand um, the, the fundamental building blocks of space-time and also the fundamental building blocks of matter, then in both cases, you, you cannot ignore the, the interplay with the other set of building blocks. So what I'm arguing here is that if you try to understand the fundamental building blocks of space-time, but you never ever think about matter, then it's very unclear whether you actually get a proper understanding of the building blocks of space-time and also vice versa. If you only ever think about the building blocks of matter and don't take into account the properties of space-time and the interplay between matter and space-time, then it's not very likely that you'll get a really good and complete understanding of the building blocks of matter. So, so more specifically, if there is a quantum theory of gravity um, that, that is built really just on its own without accounting for matter in one or another form, then it's very unclear whether this quantum theory of gravity remains viable um, once matter is added. And of course, adding matter in a quantum theory of gravity can be done in different ways. So matter can either be really added at a fundamental level, and that is very much sort of the paradigm within uh, which I will be thinking, where, where any of the, um, of the sort of fundamental building blocks sort of comes associated with its own field. But you could also think of the scenarios where, where matter is in one or another form sort of emergent from, from your more fundamental um, degrees of freedom and, or building blocks and then string theory would be a prime example for this, this sort of latter case where, where basically both gravity as well as matter sort of emerge um, from, from something more fundamental. All right, so, so this is the general motivation and so what that means is that what we would actually like to understand is a, a theory of quantum gravity plus matter and of course if we think about it really phenomenologically then we already know that matter cannot just be the matter in the standard model, but there also has to be some matter beyond the standard model, for instance, to describe um, the, the dark sector of the universe. And so that means that we also actually want to make sense out of, the, of a more ambitious path integral than what we looked at yesterday, namely the path integral over the metric and then over various matter fields um, weighted with, with, some, with the exponential of, of some um, action that sort of includes bits for, for gravity and then matter and beyond standard model, standard model matter. But obviously these pieces also talk to each other. So you can, for instance, see that, that the matter bit talks to gravity because there is always this determinant of the metric and also the metric exp appears explicitly um, in this Lagrangian here. But then of course, um, th this Lagrangian as it st stands here that has um, various problems. The problem of the gravity part, that is what we discussed yesterday is the perturbative non-renormalizability or a breakdown of productivity. Then the standard model part, we also already discussed that briefly, um, that that has a problem. Namely, if you look at how the couplings in the standard model, um, how they depend on the, on the RG scale, then at some very high Transplankian scale, some of those couplings, for instance, the GY, which is the um, coupling of the abelian hypercharge, so of the um, U1 um, symmetry group of the standard model, this coupling, for instance, um, diverges 
um, here at very high scales. It hits a so-called Landau pole, and that signals the breakdown of the theory. And I already highlighted yesterday that what is really exciting about where the mass of the Higgs was measured is that it's in this very special windows of masses where the scale of new physics actually remains um, larger than the scale of quantum gravity. And you could interpret that as saying that the standard model um, of particle physics is sort of telling us that it needs new physics, but the new physics that it needs is actually the one fundamental interaction that is so far missing from the standard model, and that would be quantum gravity. And then there's the um, beyond standard model part here. And that, um, in some sense, has the, the problem that we don't know very well what to write. So there's just a, a huge um, proliferating number of models for dark matter. Also, if you um, want to add dynamical dark energy, there's also a, a proliferating number of models for that. So we just have huge parameter spaces, and that makes it very difficult to match theory with experiment. And so, um, what I'm advocating is that there is one solution to all these three problems, and that solution could be quantum scale symmetry or asymptotic safety. And so what I already told you yesterday is how asymptotic safety could solve the problem of the gravity part um, and, and reintroduce predictivity into the theory. So we ended yesterday's lecture um, with, with reviewing the result that, that it appears that asymptotic safety comes with no more than three free parameters, and all of the other higher order curvature couplings are actually calculable and predict, um, predicted. <clears throat> and what are we doing today is talking about how asymptotic safety could make the, the standard model um, UV complete, but also more predictive. And then also how it could actually make the beyond standard model part more predictive and, and give us um, a, more, a more definite understanding or more definite prediction for, for instance, the nature of the dark matter. And I see there's a question in the chat. Um, whether the Landau pole exists also for the electroweak and the QCD interaction, no, that, that those two are actually different. So um, the um, SU2 gauge coupling, that is this blue line, the G2, um, and the, the SU3 coupling is the, the um, G3, the red dotted line. And you can see they both sort of decrease as you go towards high energies. They both become asymptotically free. Um, so there, there's a key difference between abelian and non-abelian um, gauge theories, which is that in non-abelian gauge theories, um, the gauge bosons self-interact, um, and, and that actually leads to an anti-screening of this interaction. And so um, if we would have just non-abelian um, gauge groups in the standard model, um, then, then we wouldn't have this pro problem of the, the Landau pole, at least in that sector. There's also a second Landau pole that occurs in the sort of Higgs-Yukawa sector, for instance, in the, in the Higgs quartic coupling at very high energies. You can't see it here. It, it happens a little later. All right, so um, <clears throat> that that brings me to sort of the what I what I'm dubbing the the meta metas program, which is basically the statement meta metas in quantum gravity, and we try to understand the interplay of matter and quantum gravity because that will hopefully solve the uh, problems that I raised on the previous slides. And of course, this interplay between matter and gravity really has two sides. Um, first of all, there's the effect of quantum fluctuations of matter on gravity that could or might not destroy asymptotic safety, depending on, on um, what they are. And then there's also the effect of quantum fluctuations of gravity on matter. And that can, of course, change, for instance, this plot that I was just showing on the previous slide of the um, RG flow of, of um, the standard model couplings. And so the goal of this meta matters program is to do two, two things. Firstly, develop a quantum theory of gravity that is really applicable to our universe, because as I said previously, I think a quantum theory of gravity that applies in our universe can never just be a quantum theory of gravity on its own. It needs to account for the presence and the interplay with matter. And then the second motivation to focus on the interplay of quantum gravity and matter is the testability of the theory. So I ended yesterday's lecture with, with saying that asymptotic safety appears to have just three free parameters and all of the higher order curvature couplings um, are predictions of the theory, which is very nice. It gives you a whole lot of predictions. However, it gives you predictions that are currently not very well um, accessible observationally, because even if you go to the strong field regime um, that is relevant for, for binary black hole mergers or, or for black hole shadows, 
then the curvature is just not large enough in order to to access um, curvature couplings um, of, for instance, curvature squared or higher order couplings um, th that aren't just just very 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 huge. So the current experimental constraints on curvature squared couplings. Um, are something of the order of 10 to the 60 or so. And so that is not a very strong constraint, right? And so this, this tells you that if we want to be able to test something like asymptotic safety, then just focusing on the pure gravity theory on its own, that was not likely to get us very far at the moment. And instead, I will be telling you about how the impact of quantum gravity on matter um, could actually make the theory testable. Um, and um, I'd be a little... Um, biased in today's lecture and, and focusing um, quite a bit on, on work um, that has happened in, in my own group. So um, a, a less biased and more comprehensive view of the fields, you can find that, for instance, in, in these reviews um, here, and also in particular the most recent um, one that I uh, wrote together with Mark Schiffer and where we try to really give a comprehensive view of what is happening um, in this field. All right, so let's get started. I'll be focusing on the impact of quantum gravity on matter today. To very briefly summarize, there is an impact of matter on quantum gravity. It shifts um, the fixed point values um, around, but if you don't add too much matter, um, then, then you don't change the gravity theory too much. I'll come back to that statement um, in a little while because it will become important later. But I will mostly focus on the impact of quantum gravity on matter, in particular with this view of testing asymptotic safety with current observations. And of course, there is a challenge here, um, namely that there is a big separation of scales between the, the scales that typically matter in particle physics and that we have access to experimentally, which is sort of the 100 GeV to 10 TeV um, range of scales at the LHC. And then what we expect the scale of quantum gravity to be, namely the Planck scale 10 to the 19 GeV. And the separation of scales in particular also implies that quantum gravity is what I would call dynamically unimportant in particle physics, which means that if you want to describe particle physics experiments nowadays, so if you want to, for instance, calculate scattering cross sections, then in these dynamics, gravity is completely negligible. The scattering cross sections are dominated by the other three fundamental interactions, but the actual sort of graviton contribution to particle scattering at the LHC is present, but it's really unmeasurably tiny. However, this does not mean that quantum gravity doesn't play a role for particle physics. Because quantum gravity does impact matter at and beyond the Planck scale, so it really impacts matter at microscopic scales, at the, at the very fundamental level. And then the thing that we need to understand is whether there is a lever arm or what this lever arm could, looks like, could look like that translates effects at these microscopic fundamental scales to sort of an effective description at standard model scales. And to understand that lever arm, I like to use an analogy before I go into the more technical details of how this works in particle physics and gravity. Um, and, and for this analogy, we will think of, of a different system. So we will not focus on quantum gravity um, and particle physics. Instead, we'll focus um, on a microscopic theory that, that where the microscopic degrees of freedom are to different sets of molecules. <clears throat> and then our macroscopic um, setting where we can where we imagine that we can make experiments that will be sort of everyday scales of sort of centimeter to meter. Um, and then what one usually has in mind for these type of systems is that even if you start with microscopically quite different um, systems, so microscopically very different molecules, as you then, then zoom out, to sort of centimeter or meter scales, you end up with a hydrodynamic description um, for both of these. And so even though they were quite different at the microscopic scales, you end up with something quite similar at macroscopic scales. And this is usually the picture that we have in mind when we think of the relation of quantum gravity to particle physics. We think that even if we start with models which are quite different at microscopic scales, and we usually think of strings and asymptotic safety as being quite different, although um, feel free to ask me whether or not there, there could be a relation between them in the discussion session, or if there's interest, I can also prepare a bit of a discussion on this for Friday. But in any case, if we assume that we have two very different models of quantum gravity at the Planck scale, then we usually imagine that as we zoom out to much larger scales, this microscopic information is sort of really washed out and gets lost, and we just end up with a standard model of particle physics. And so conversely, by making measurements of various interactions, um, and particle physics properties here, 
we usually think that we can't draw any inference on what this microscopic model could be. And now I'll be challenging this, this sort of standard way of thinking. Um, and I first do that in this analogy. Um, because it's actually not true that that all of the microscopic information that you have here gets lost as you zoom out. It's only most of the microscopic information. And there are imprints of the microscopic physics that make it all the way to the macroscopic scales. And one of the um, examples that you can think of here um, is the viscosity um, of this sort of um, um, effective description of the hydrodynamic description. So the viscosity is something that arises directly at the microscopic scale from the different molecular interactions. You can calculate what the viscosity will be. But of course, you can measure the viscosity at scales which are much, much larger than the microscopic scale. And so it's one example where you could calculate a quantity in the microscopic model, and then you can make a measurement at much, much larger distances and can see whether or not your theoretic prediction agrees. And so this is then the, the analogy that we now have to realize when we want to use particle physics to probe quantum gravity, we need to understand what aspects of the standard model are actually sensitive to the microphysics or which parts of the standard model sort of retain microscopic information as we zoom out. And there are, from this point of view, sort of two different types of couplings in the standard model. Um, one is um, higher order couplings. Um, and one example would be um, a phi to the six interaction where phi would be something like the Higgs field. And for those, this intuition that microscopic information gets lost as we zoom out to larger scales is actually true. And you can see this in this plot here. So the different curves here start with different values of this coupling at the UV scale. And the UV scale in this case is the Planck scale. And then you can see that the renormalization group flow very quickly um, pulls all of these different curves onto one basically universal curve. And that means that if you measure the value of the coupling down here, you have no way to infer what the value at the Planck scale actually was. So this is one of those examples that satisfies this, um, th th this intuition that a lot of the microscopic details actually get lost as we zoom out to larger scales. But in the standard model, we also have couplings that depend on the scale only logarithmically. And um, for a coupling that depends on the scale only logarithmically, if you put in a somewhat different value at the Planck scale, then the value that you get out at um, low energies where you can make experiments, that value will still be different and it will be measurably different. And so these logarithmically scale dependent couplings, they sort of preserve a memory of the initial conditions at the Planck scale. And so those will be the couplings that we will particularly be interested in. Because it means that if we can make a prediction for the value at the Planck scale, then that prediction translates into a corresponding prediction at low energies. And it's a prediction that is that is really um, unique uh, or uniquely associated with the value at the Planck scale, right? If you change the value of the prediction at the Planck scale, you change the value at low energies. And so in this way, um, you, you sort of have a, a lever arm that translates um, effects at this microscopic scale, the Planck scale, into effects at large scales. All right. And what I've said so far is, is really not specific to asymptotically safe quantum gravity at all. It would, it would hold whenever you, you have a fundamental theory that gives you a prediction for the value of one of the logarithmically running couplings in the standard model. The specific thing about asymptotic safety is that we do, of course, have a mechanism which can generate predictions for the values of couplings, um, basically by requiring scale symmetry, as, as we discussed yesterday. And so um, this is a quite a busy slide. And so let, let's start down here. So what we are looking at here is now a, a setting where we have taken the standard model with its usual particle content. And then we are only adding the one missing interaction, um, namely the gravitational interaction and its corresponding field. And then that, of course, becomes important beyond the Planck scale because the dimensionless version of the gravitational coupling that is very, very tiny at all scales, which are um, lower energy scales or larger distances than the Planck scale. But once the gravitational coupling has become large and then also become asymptotically safe, there is, of course, an impact on all of the couplings in the standard model. And I'll be reviewing that in more detail <clears throat> in, the, in the next few slides. What then happens is 
that the couplings in the standard model um, can no longer run into into Landau poles, um, at least within specific um, ranges of values. And I'll also review that. So instead, they become either asymptotically safe or they run towards asymptotic freedom. And some of the couplings, not all of the couplings, actually become irrelevant couplings. So you might remember um, this, this um, picture from yesterday where I told you that if we combine screening and anti-screening effects in a beta function appropriately, we can get a prediction for the value of the coupling. And this actually happens for some of the couplings in the standard model. And the story started with, with the idea that the Higgs quartic coupling that determines the mass of the Higgs boson could be such a prediction. And the value was calculated for the Higgs mass, which actually is just a few GeV um, away from the actual measured value. Um, and, and that happened before the actual measurement of the of the Higgs mass. And it also has to be said that this, this prediction, it is a few GeV away from the measured value, but it also comes with some significant systematic uncertainties, which are very likely, which are of course difficult to estimate, but very likely larger than this, than this difference to the measured value. So you could say this was a successful prediction of the sort of approximate value um, of the Higgs mass or of the sort of order of magnitude of the Higgs mass. And then after that, it was also found that a few other couplings in the standard model could also fall into the same category that they changed their status. In the standard model, they are free parameters. They can basically have any value. There is no theoretical prediction. But if I want the standard model with gravity to become asymptotically safe, then the values of these couplings at the Planck scale are no longer free parameters, but they have to be quite particular values because they correspond to irrelevant couplings. And this then, of course, makes this whole um, theory testable because these couplings only depend logarithmically on the scale. And so if I get a particular prediction for a value here at the Planck scale, I can translate that into the corresponding prediction at low energies. <clears throat> and this general idea of how you could test quantum gravity that is really not specific to asymptotic safety. So any model of quantum gravity, which gives you a prediction for a value of the coupling in the standard model, you can test that in the same way um, by translating it to the corresponding low energy value. What is specific about asymptotic safety is how the predictions at the Planck scale arise, because they arise from this requirement of quantum scale symmetry. All right, so I, I will next go um, into a few more details to show you to show you more about how these predictions um, arise and, and what they are and what their status is. But before I do that, let me pause to see whether there are questions at this moment. All right, no questions right now. So then let me continue. Um, as a sort of proof of principle or sort of blueprint for how the predictions work, I'll, I'll focus on the gauge sector. So the gauge sector in the standard model, um, there are the, the three gauge couplings, um, and I'll, I'll abbreviate um, them generically with, a, with this little g. And the beta function for those that has a, a one loop term, um, that is just a, that just depends on the on the meta um, part of the standard model, and then quantum gravity also contributes. Um, to that, and it actually contributes linearly in the coupling. Um, this FG um, is just a way of, of encoding um, the, the gravitational contribution. I'll just I'll show you the, the function that this is in terms of the gravitational couplings in just a second. But first, I would li like to highlight two points about that. The first is that this type of linear term, we saw something similar yesterday when I told you about the mechanisms for asymptotic safety and where I mentioned that one mechanism, how you can get asymptotic safety is if you start with a theory in the dimension where the coupling is dimensionless and then you change the space-time dimensionality, then generically you get this type of linear term into the beta function. Um, and so you can see here that the effect of quantum fluctuations of the metric is structurally the same as if you would have this, this change in the space-time dimensionality. So if you want sort of a really intuitive way to think about quantum fluctuations of gravity and the, uh, the effect on the meta couplings, it's as if the meta theory would live on, on an effective space-time of, of a dimensionality that is slightly deviating from four. And you can sort of intuitively imagine that as sort of your, your space-time fluctuates, um, the fluctuations sort of make the, the, the meta fields believe, quote unquote, that, that the effective dimensionality isn't exactly four. 
Then the other aspect to highlight about this is that that this value fg that is not dependent um, on um, which gauge group I'm looking at. So it will be the same for the U1 and the SU2 and the SU3 in the standard model. And that is because gravity doesn't see anything of the of the internal symmetries. So gravity only couples to the space-time structure of a field. So that means that gravity knows, quote unquote, that it's coupling to, to a vector or a spinner or a scalar, but it doesn't, quote unquote, know whether this, this um, vector, for instance, is also um, uh, transforming in the rep in, in, within some representation of, of some internal symmetry group. So whether it, for instance, carries some form of color. <clears throat> and this is what, what makes um, this gravitational contribution universal in the sense that it doesn't depend um, on, on this internal symmetry. All right, now let me say a little bit about what this FG actually looks like. Looks like. So you can see it, it's been calculated in quite a, a, a list of different, um, different works. And here I'm showing you what the function looks like as a function of the Newton coupling and the cosmological constant that I mentioned as counterparts. So as you insert the fixed point value for G and for lambda, then this FG will take a particular numerical value. Now, of course, it also depends on higher order um, interactions in the gravitational sector. So the R squared coupling, for instance, would also make an appearance here. And I'm just not showing you the corresponding equation because it gets longer. Um, you can also think about higher order terms in the gauge sector. And, and I'll, I will talk about this universality aspect in just a second. I'll, I'll first want to discuss what the actual consequence of this term is. Um, and for that, we, we don't need to know this exact structure here. We just need to know that if we go to the asymptotically safe fixed point regime where G and lambda are constant, then this FG is also a constant and it takes some numerical value. And you can show that it's generically larger than zero. And then if you go to the regime below the Planck scale, then the dimension as Newton coupling very quickly plunges to zero, which means that the FG goes to zero and this term just disappears from the beta function and you just get back the pure standard model beta function without quantum gravity fluctuations as you would expect below the Planck scale. Now, what is the consequence of this term then? For the non-abelian gauge couplings, the beta zero, the one loop coefficient that is negative, that encodes this screening, sorry, the anti-screening um, nature of the vacuum for these interactions. Um, and it means that there is asymptotic freedom. And because the FG is positive, <clears throat> minus FG is also negative. And so asymptotic freedom is just preserved for the SU2 and the SU3 gauge coupling. So that's, of course, an important aspect that asymptotic safety doesn't destroy asymptotic freedom in those sectors. But then the abelian gauge coupling, this is one of those couplings that has a Landau pole. Um, so it diverges as we go to very high energies. And this now changes with gravity. Um, so for the abelian gauge coupling, the beta zero is positive, And now the FG comes in with this negative sign. And so there's a competition between gravity and matter fluctuations. And that actually means that we're exactly in this setup that I told you yesterday uh, about where, where predictions and asymptotic safety come from, because the higher order term is a screening term and the lowest order one, which is generated by gravity is an anti-screening term. And that means that as long as both gravity and matter fluctuations are present, they will always drive you back towards this unique value of the coupling, namely the fixed point value. And then of course, you, once you reach the Planck scale, the anti-screening gravity fluctuations, they drop away. And so then you can start to depart from the, the fixed point value. But that means that at the Planck scale, you actually get a prediction for the value of that coupling. So you can see the, the whole picture in here then. So this green trajectory is the, the unique trajectory which becomes asymptotically safe. And you can also still see that it attracts the other trajectories, although we've only included a subset of them. And then at the Planck scale, gravity fluctuations decouple. But at that scale, you get a prediction um, from, from asymptotic safety. And then gravity fluctuations decouple. The screening effect of matter kicks in and drives the coupling to some lower value. But from this unique value at the Planck scale, you get a unique value in the infrared. And now at the same time, this unique value acts as an upper bound. Because if the value of the gauge coupling is low enough at low energies, then the UV behavior will just be dominated by this leading order gravitational term, which will just make the gauge theory asymptotically free. And so this means 
and that you can reach a whole range of gauge couplings at low energies from asymptotically free fixed from an asymptotically free fixed point and then there is an upper bound on that that corresponds to the asymptotically safe fixed point and then you can see that any larger value of the gauge coupling is connected to a trajectory where this screening effect here still makes the the theory um, unsafe um, and and you still have a lambda pole and then um you can actually calculate this this upper bound um, and we did this in in this paper here and we found a, a result that is about approximately 30 percent above the experimental data which actually means that the upper bound that we get from asymptotic safety is very well compatible with experiment but we also have to say that it's it comes with quite significant systematic uncertainties um, and of course it's it's a key goal to to reduce those by for instance making the truncation in, um, in, in those calculations larger and see whether the upper bound still persists to be above the experimental value or not. Are there questions um, on this point? All right, no questions at the moment. Then I would like to spend five minutes um, on, on something that is a bit more of a technical point, but it, it addresses um, what I think is an important confusion in the literature. And that's the question of universality and connection to perturbative results. Um, so just, just sort of five minutes or three, three to five minutes, which will be um, somewhat more technical. Um, so so if, you, if you don't um, care so much about he hearing about the technicalities, then you can tune back in in, in three to five minutes. Um, where I'll I'll talk more about phenomenology again. So um, the the important technical aspect is that this FG is not universal, which means that it depends on the scheme in which this beta function is calculated. Um, and it has been shown that in some schemes, for instance, in dimensional regularization, um, this FG would actually vanish. And this has led to some debate in the literature about whether or not there is a gravitational impact on, on the running of the matter coupling. And one of the key assumptions that was made in the literature is that the gravity coupling G is always treated as a fixed external parameter. However, one has to be very careful because beta functions in general um, are not physical observables, so they can very well depend on schemes. And so one has to be really careful that one actually argues at the level of physical observables um, or of universal quantities. Um, and it turns out that there's a subtlety, namely that if you just calculate a contribution in a beta function, that will in general not be universal. But if you if you take into account that the gravity coupling has its own beta function and you combine the two beta functions, then um, this FG actually is related to a critical exponent. And I told you yesterday that critical exponents have to be universal. And so it turns out that if you calculate the FG in a scheme where it's it vanishes if you treat G as a fixed parameter, but then you take into account the beta function for G in that same scheme that then the result will be non-vanishing. Um, and, and this is work with um, Gustavo de Brito. And the scheme that we used is an FRG scheme, which depends on this um, um, regulated parameter A. So A is an unphysical parameter. The, the one key point about A is that um, as you choose it, to, to as you choose the limit where a goes to zero, you can clearly see that fg just becomes zero if you just treat g as a fixed number. But now you can also calculate the beta function for g in that same scheme, and then you can calculate the fixed point. And it turns out that the fixed point is actually of such a structure that the fixed point for g would actually move off to infinity as you take the limit a going to zero. And so this also shows you that you have to be careful with beta functions and with fixed point values because there can very well be schemes in which a fixed point actually lies at an infinite value of a coupling. But you can also see that if you combine these two and you evaluate fg at this fixed point value here, then this a log a and one over a log a actually cancel precisely. And then the limit a going to zero is actually a, a universal and finite limit um, and the gravitational contribution to the matter coupling actually persists. And you can also see that as you vary across this whole range of A's, um, there is actually not so much of a variation in this, in this actual value of that quantity. 
And so this is sort of just a, a word of warning um, that when one calculates quantum gravity contributions to matter, one has to be very careful in distinguishing what are really observables and universal quantities from what are non-universal quantities that one calculates as some intermediate step of going towards a physical prediction. And it's very difficult to, or one should be careful about arguing at the level of these unphysical intermediate um, quantities. Um, and in particular, one should be extremely careful in comparing schemes at these intermediate levels of, of calculations because there is really no reason why beta functions evaluated in different schemes should actually agree. And there's a question um, in, in the chat. Is there any physical interpretation of A? Um, not really. It's, it's really just a, a parameter in this in this regulator function in the FRG. Um, as you take A to zero, you, you, you strictly speaking take the limit where the regulator itself goes to zero. Um, so so um, it connects very nicely to, to, these other regular, uh, to these other regularization schemes, which also don't depend on a mass-like cutoff. So the, the thing about dimensional regularization is that it, it doesn't introduce um, a cutoff with a mass scale, as the FRG regulator does. And so this, this A going to zero limit is sort of a nice way of, of connecting to these other types of, of schemes. Um, but there is no physical interpretation. It's, it's really an, an unphysical parameter. All right, now, now back from the technical excursion, unless there are more questions on that. So, so then coming back from the technical excursion um, to the quantum gravity effects on the, the standard model couplings and, and understanding what are predictions um, that arise from asymptotic safety. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about the Yukawa sector next because that's a quite interesting sector. <clears throat> it works quite similar to the gauge sector. So there's a, a beta function contribution just from the matter part. Um, and then a, a contribution that comes from metric fluctuations, again, linear in the coupling. And why here are the different Yukawa couplings in particular, I, I'm focusing on the top um, Yukawa coupling because that is the largest Yukawa coupling in the standard model. And now this Fy is again a function of the gravitational parameters, uh, a different one than the Fg, but also a function that can be calculated and that is constant above the Planck scale and drops to zero below the Planck scale. And so we have a very similar situation to the gauge theory with the one distinction that the sign of this Fy actually depends on the values of the gravitational couplings at high, at high scales. And that's been calculated in different approximations. But if we look um, at the gravitational um, space of couplings that I'll show you in a second, we will see that there is a division where it changes sign. So let's now explore what the consequence of choosing different signs is. First, if we choose Fy smaller than zero, then we have both of these terms in the beta function being positive, being screening. And that means that there is only a single fixed point that the theory has, which lies at zero. And it is such that the coupling is irrelevant at this fixed point, which means it's driven towards zero. So this means that you have to set the, UK, the top Yukawa coupling to zero all the way above the Planck scale. All trajectories which have a non-zero Y would be UV unsafe. And in particular, if you set the top Yukawa coupling to zero at the Planck scale, it will remain zero. So the RG flow cannot drive it away from zero if it is set to zero at the Planck scale. And so the, in this way, you just have a single value for the top Yukawa coupling that is compatible with asymptotic safety, and it's a vanishing value of the top Yukawa coupling. And now, since the, the Higgs was detected at the LHC in 2012, um, experimentalists have started to measure the various Yukawa couplings to the various fermions. Um, and the, the top Yukawa coupling was one of the first ones to be measured because it's so large. And um, both CMS and ATLAS have confirmed that the top Yukawa coupling is most definitely non-zero. Which actually means that if we have a situation in which asymptotic safety predicts the Fy to be smaller than zero, then we're in direct contradiction with the experimental results. And so that would be a way to rule out the theory. Now, what's the other setting? The other possibility is in principle that the Fy is positive. And then we really have the same type of situation that we had for the gauge sector, because we have a screening term for matter competing with an anti-screening term for gravity. And so that generates an asymptotically safe fixed point that at the same time generates an upper bound for all of those values of the Yukawa coupling that become asymptotically free under the impact of gravity. And so this unique value that this asymptotically safe fixed point gives rise to at the Planck scale 
then translates into an upper bound at low energies. And we calculated it and we got an upper bound that is um, that translates into a top Yukawa top mass of approximately 171 um, GeV. And the, the measured value is, is very, very close to that with some uncertainty. So indeed, it, it therefore turns out that the value of Fy um, in, in, um, um, in, in these works where we look at the fixed point value under the impact of matter turns out to be positive. So what I'm showing you here now is the parameter space of the gravitational couplings. And there is this whole regime where Fy would be negative, which would be in um, contradiction with the experiment because it would predict a vanishing top mass and a vanishing top Yukawa coupling. And then there's a regime where you get a non-zero um, top mass. And there's quite an intriguing interplay between gravity and matter because if we start with just one generation of standard model fermions, then um, in this work here, we found a gravitational fixed point that lies in this regime here. And then as we add a second and a third generation, then, then the fixed point value actually moves into this viable regime. And then um, it gives rise to, to this plot here. So this plot here is with these gravitational fixed point values and it gives rise to this upper bound that is um, 171 for the top mass. And I see that there's a question in the chat. Yes, um, so, so the question is whether Fy is different from the previous Fg. Yeah, so the Fy is a different function of the gravitational couplings than Fg. So in particular, Fg doesn't have this type of behavior that it changes sign across the parameter space. Fg would be positive everywhere. Whereas Fy really, it depends on, on whether there is gravitational screening or anti-screening that depends on the fixed point values. Uh, hi, um, sorry. Yeah? So um, what, what actually happens to this uh, red uh, area now? Um, uh, this, this because I've, yeah, in the way that, uh, well, I've seen papers not long ago saying that maybe uh, this is this picture has changed uh, a little bit or? Um, you, you mean the, the weak gravity bound? Um, you mean this? Yes. Red yes, so I was actually yes. going to so talk that... about it next. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, sorry, okay. Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so first, I, I wanted to sort of wrap up the, this discussion on um, of sort of the standard model couplings, um, to say um, that there are of course still very significant systematic uncertainties um, where the fixed point values really lie, um, but within those um, uncertainties, um, the asymptotically safe standard model um, um, passes passes the observational tests, and indeed I wanted to talk about the the weak gravity bound a little bit more. The weak gravity bound is indicated in this plot here as a sort of red area, um, which, which is an, an, an area that is sort of completely forbidden in term in, in contrast to this orange area where a fixed point could in principle lie and would just produce phenomenology that, that isn't viable. So, so what's the story of the weak gravity bound? And I'll first uh, tell you sort of the, the story as it was um, un, until a few months ago, and then I'll comment a bit on, on sort of newer results. So the weak gravity bound <clears throat> that um, addresses um, couplings um, that, that are not um, the, the marginal couplings of the standard model, but what, which are higher order interactions in the matter sector and also non-minimal couplings between matter and gravity. Um, and the, the point about those couplings is that they are all canonically irrelevant <clears throat> um, and they can be induced by gravity, which means that it's not viable to have a fixed point where these couplings are simply set to zero. And now they are canonically irrelevant, which is just technical language to say that at the free fixed point, they would correspond to quantities that can be predicted and that are not free parameters. And so if the fixed, the asymptotically safe fixed point would be sort of strongly non-perturbative, then you could imagine that those couplings become shifted from being irrelevant to become relevant. And then you would suddenly have new parameters um, in, the, in the matter sector. Um, belonging to interactions that um, we don't see any, any hint of that they are large in the standard model, um, but which would suddenly become potentially large and would become would be associated to free parameters and asymptotic safety. And so th this is a, a regime that we would like to avoid. Um, and the, the sort of simple story of those is that if you look at the corresponding beta functions and G1 is just one such example for such a, a meta coupling, um, then, Without gravity, the beta function is as follows. It, it has a fixed point um, at vanishing value 
of the coupling. But then as you switch on gravity, so as you go to a non-vanishing value of the Newton coupling, you can no longer sit at the free fixed point. Instead, you have to sit at an interacting fixed point. And then the structure of these beta functions is such that there is a second zero at larger values of these um, of these couplings. And the gravitational contribution just shifts this, this parabola upwards. And so you, you can see that there is a critical value for the Newton coupling beyond which you actually lose the real zeros of this beta function. And so this is what defined what, what's now sort of called the old weak gravity bound. This is this red area here. This is where in these in these simple beta functions, you don't have a real fixed point anymore. And so you couldn't be there with asymptotic safety. Um, th there is now this, this more recent paper um, by Gustavo de Brito, Benjamin Knorr, and Mark Schiffer, who looked at um, the weak gravity bound in the scalar interactions in more detail, uh, in a much more elaborate truncation. And they found indications that the simple picture um, of, of how fixed points get lost due to a fixed point collision, that that might not necessarily be realized. But they found that this mechanism, that there is some critical value for the Newton coupling beyond which um, these um, interactions would suddenly become free parameters, that that actually persists. And so there is still a bound on the value on, on the um, on the gravitational coupling here um, that constrains the gravitational couplings, unless you want a, a sort of proliferation of of free parameters in the meta sector associated to sort of very non-standard interactions that we don't see any indication of um, in sort of standard particle physics. All right, is there um, a question on this point? All right, if that's not the case, then I'll move on um, for, the, for the last maybe 15 minutes or so, so that we then have a um, good amount of time for questions. I'll move on to talk about physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. So addressing the, the dark universe, because of course we all know that the standard model of particle physics is really just 5% um, of the energy density of the universe. The dark energy in asymptotic safety could very well have an explanation in the form of a cosmological constant. It could also potentially be a, a, dynamical, a dynamical field. Um, but I, I'll not talk about that option here. Instead, I want to focus on the dark matter sector, um, which is generically really believed to provide us with uh, a bunch of new elementary particles. However, the challenge is that we don't really know basically anything about them, except that they interact gravitationally and are not extremely strongly coupled with the standard model. But for instance, we really have no clue what the dark matter mass could be. So um, as we go through the different orders of magnitude, um, in potential masses, basically at every mass scale, you have a distinct dark matter candidate um, from sort of the more well-known um, WIMP settings through through um, through settings that were maybe a few years ago considered more exotic and, and are now also very popular. But you can see that there is just a huge range in masses, which is populated by, by different sort of paradigms for what dark matter could be. And of course, that is a very unsatisfactory situation from a theoretical point of view, because it really means that we don't know anything about the nature of dark matter. And we would very much like to be able to make a more definite prediction what we expect dark matter to be. Also a more definite prediction that we could hand to experimentalists and say, well, we really believe you should be looking in this particular mass range for this particular type of, of particle, instead of saying, well, why don't you try your best at looking at all of these um, orders of magnitude in mass? And so I think what we need in order to achieve this is some, some new paradigm um, th that we um, put into our way of thinking um, about dark matter that would make the sector more predictive. And I see that there's a question in the, in the chat. Um, so is there any change in the mechanism of asymptotic safety of gravity matter interactions for modified theories of gravity, for example, brown sticky? Um, so it really depends on the on the modification. So so brown sticky is is basically just just gravity with a with a scalar field, and um, th that has been in investigated in in different truncations, and there is good evidence for asymptotic safety. But of course, you can modify gravity in in very many different ways. You can, for instance, think about um, the the metric and the connection as independent degrees of freedom. Um, that gives you. 
which uh, are classically even equivalent to GR, depending on, on how exactly you, you do that. Um, they have only been investigated a little bit um, from the point of view of asymptotic safety. And there are some indications that there is asymptotic safety in the theory. Um, but certainly the sort of the big space of modified gravity theories has not been comprehensively investigated for which of those are asymptotically safe and which aren't. But in general, something like asymptotic safety, of course, depends on what fields are present and what are the allowed interactions. And so if you change fields in the gravitational sector, as you change the symmetries maybe in the gravitational sector and things like that, then you would in general expect that not all of these changes are, are compatible with asymptotic safety. So it's indeed also an interesting open question to understand which theories of gravity become asymptotically safe and which don't. All right, I hope that, that answered the question. And, and I'll now uh, continue with the, with the dark sector. So the general idea is um, to use the predictive power of asymptotic safety that, that we already saw in, in some examples that it has. Um, use that predictive power um, to um, make the, the model as a whole more testable. And sorry, I'm just trying to remove the chat from my screen. I'll just put it aside. All right, sorry about that. So the general idea um, is that this predictive power would make concrete predictions for the dark matter sector and would potentially rule out some of these models or constrain other models. And in this way, we not only have a more predictive dark matter sector, but we also make predictions which are from quantum gravity, which are testable, right? Because if we, for instance, say that a certain dark matter candidate cannot exist in asymptotic safety, then of course, experimentally detecting this dark matter candidate is um, a, a way to ruling of ruling out asymptotic safety. And so I'll talk about two examples um, of, of, this, um, of this line of work um, on the WIMP paradigm and, on, and then on axion-like particles. So um, I'll start with sort of the simplest model of dark matter. That's a single scalar field, phi. And you can couple that to the um, Higgs of the standard model through a so-called Higgs-Portal coupling. And that Higgs-Portal coupling um, allows this um, singlet scalar to be thermally produced in the early universe. So it can be in thermal equilibrium with the standard model. And then once the, the, the temperature um, drops sufficiently in the early universe, the, the reaction rate um, go, goes down significantly so that there is just a, a, a relic abundance of the scalar field that freezes out. And of course, this portal coupling also means that you can search um, for this field experimentally, for instance, um, by scattering um, at the at the LHC. Um, you would expect to have um, processes with sort of missing mass, um, where, where some or missing energy, um, where this particle is produced. Um, and through this portal, you can also interact with um, with basically with with um, nucleons and so um, experiments such as the the xenon um, experiment can then also detect this this portal um, coupling to the dark scalar and now the question is whether or not this portal coupling is compatible with asymptotic safety and um, it is compatible uh, only if you actually set it to zero because the beta function for that gets a contribution for gravity and um, that is encoded in this in this next function here, this f lambda. So this is again a function of the gravitational parameters just as the fg and the fy, but it's a different function. It's a function that is positive everywhere in the gravitational parameter space. And it actually means that quantum gravity fluctuations drive the portal coupling to zero at the Planck scale. And you can see this in this plot. So here we start with a whole lot of different values of this portal coupling somewhere in the deep UV, and they're all driven to zero at the Planck scale. And so the asymptotically safe prediction is that the value of the portal coupling vanishes at the Planck scale. And if you have a dark sector, which is really just a single scalar field, then if you set the portal coupling to zero at the Planck scale, it will not be regenerated below. So it will just remain zero forever. And this means that the dark scalar really decouples in asymptotic safety. It cannot be thermally produced. And therefore, you don't have a relic density. And also, you can't search for it experimentally. You will not expect to detect anything. And that actually fits very nicely with the fact that experiments <clears throat> have searched through the parameter space for this, this portal coupling. So this lambda HSS is just the same thing as the lambda H here. And as a function of the mass of this dark scalar um, and um, 
basically all of the viable parameter space except this this one time is already ruled out. So this this black line here is the line from um, from from relic density. Um, if you go below that line, um, th then you overclose the universe. And then this this blue shaded region here is is what is already excluded by by direct searches. And so you see that there's only a, a tiny little bit of the parameter space that remains. Everything else is ruled out. So that actually fits nicely with the experimental with the asymptotically safe result that we don't expect um, this to be a viable dark matter candidate. Now you could ask, well, this is a really simple model of the dark sector, just a single field. Wouldn't we maybe expect the dark sector to be more complicated? And if it is more complicated, generate the, the portal um, by adding these new fields. Um, and the answer is yes. So there are two examples um, or three examples actually in the literature where you regenerate the portal by adding new fields. And I don't want to talk about the details of that too much. What I would like to highlight is actually just this one um, plot down here. Um, so, so this is in one particular model where we've added um, a dark fermion to the setting and um, where um, the dark sector now has six free parameters and then the mass the quartic interaction of the dark scalar, the non-minimal coupling of the dark scalar, um, the um, Yukawa um, coupling um, between the dark scalar and the dark fermion and the, the portal coupling. And then there's also a mixing angle with the standard model Higgs. So as a sort of phenomenological model or effective feed theory, this would have a six dimensional parameter space. And now if you require it to be asymptotically safe, then most of these couplings um, cannot just take an arbitrary value because most of those couplings actually become irrelevant. And that means that in the six dimensional parameter space, um, which we've sort of tried to depict here, you now have a single line on which you can realize asymptotic safety, which means that is, as you know, the mass of the dark scalar, then all of the other couplings in the theory actually become calculable. And so this is just to, to show um, that indeed there's quite a lot of predictive power in asymptotic safety, that models which as an as effective field theories have lots of free parameters or as, as phenomenological models they have they can have way fewer parameters in asymptotic safety and then of course this is a definite prediction that if you would do a more elaborate calculation so here we did this in a sort of toy model of the setting but if you would do this in a in a more extended setting then a prediction like this is something that you can really compare to um, experimental results should such a dark sector ever be detected all right, so, so summarizing what we know about the, the Higgs portal to dark matter and asymptotic safety, the, the sort of vanilla model with a single field is definitely ruled out. And then extended dark sectors are not ruled out. They have very reduced parameter spaces, so there's lots of predictive power. But of course, what is really not so nice about these, these extended dark sectors is that we've added additional fields only to circumvent the result from the vanilla model um, that, that this is actually ruled out. And so this is what is sort of unattractive about these models from maybe sort of Occam's razor point of view. So um, to, to um, close the discussion for today, I, I briefly also talk about another candidate for dark matter, which is axion-like particles. So the cool thing about axion-like particles is um, they are these, these fields written as A here. They can couple to the electromagnetic field strength and its dual. And that actually allows you to shine light through a wall because if you take for instance a, a laser, high intensity laser, and you shine it against a wall, but you have a high magnetic field in front of it, then you have, th then this interaction allows you a conversion of photons into axion-like particles. And axion-like particles are not generically very strongly coupled, so they just can they can just traverse this wall. And if you put another magnetic field behind the wall, then you can regenerate a photon, and in this way you have um, shown light through a wall. So this is one way how, you, how one can look for axions or axion-like particles. Um, they also um, constitute a dark matter candidate, um, namely an ultralight dark matter candidate where the mass is generically in the sub-electron volt um, regime, so different from the WIMP paradigm. Um, now, what we care about is obviously this axion-photon coupling and the question whether it can or cannot be, whether it can be non-zero in asymptotic safety. And so the beta function for that coupling without gravity just consists of positive terms, which would mean that the coupling only has a fixed point at zero, and it's also irrelevant at that at that fixed point. So um, 
the, the if you want this model to be UV complete, um, the coupling has to vanish. And now we can ask, does or does this not change with gravity? And then um, by, by now you probably understand the pattern that whenever you switch on gravity, there will be a contribution to a beta function of the matter coupling that is linear in this coupling and that comes with some function of the gravitational parameters. And you can see that the sign here is such that if the FGA is positive, it can overwhelm this term here. Um, and there should actually be a, a square um, on this term here because I'm looking at the beta function for g squared. Sorry about that. So this term here can win, but only if the FGA is, is larger than two. And then we can ask, well, where in the gravitational parameter space does this happen? And it actually happens in this hatched um, region up here. So you can see we need quite sizable fixed point values for the gravitational coupling. And then our sort of best guess with significant uncertainties for the fixed point value actually lies down here. So quite far away from this region that we would have to be in if we wanted the fixed point value for the um, axion photon coupling to shift away from zero. And so this led us to conclude that there are no fundamental ALPs in the asymptotically safe landscape. And I'm writing no fundamental ALPs because here we really treated the, this axion-like particle as sort of a single fundamental field, um, whereas you can also have models where the axon actually emerges as a pseudo Goldstone boson out of um, a, a spontaneous symmetry breaking of some more elaborate model, and we've not investigated that. Um, and so with that, um, I'm actually at the end of the, the slides um, for today, um, where I talked about particle physics. Um, and um, on Friday, I then talk about um, black holes um, and also some of the open challenges um, of asymptotic safety. But for now, I'm looking forward to questions and the discussion about particle physics. All right. Um, thank you, Astrid. Let me stop the recording.